God God some praise this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse seventeen. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. We serve a God. We come to this place to praise a God who gives us that second chance, who gives us that third chance, fourth chance, fifth chance, every single chance we can imagine and do not deserve to come back to him. That regardless of what our life may have been, that when we come to God, we have that moment of restoration. We are the new creation. We are now his. That is an amazing thing. As we stand here, as we sing these songs, as we hear the message that we have been given that second chance. We've been given that forgiveness, that love, that mercy, that grace. And as we sing it, as we hear it, we're given a chance to show that to the world around us. Pray with me this morning. Father God, I thank you. I thank you that regardless of what may have been before, we have now been made new in you. That you have taken us out of this world and made us your son, made us your daughter. We are now in a relationship with you. We know your love. We know your presence. And now we have the chance to share that with those around us. God, be with us as we sing these songs, as we hear your word proclaimed. Stir that passion in our hearts to make sure that everyone around us can know that second chance.
put our hands together, we can celebrate that we have been made sons and daughters. I want to encourage you this morning through God's word to put your faith, to put your trust in God as our saving king. And I want to do that by making a comparison from history. I remember growing up and you see the movie 300 and I was very inspired by the battle at Thermopylae and the Spartans from the very earliest stages of their life. It was a tough life. They were born and bred to be fighters. They were born and bred to be tough and they had the best military strategy and technology of the day. They had this strategy called the phalanx where they would lock shields together like a tank and they could move and protect one another from the knee to almost the head. And they would shoot spears over the top and it was very, very tough to get past that. In fact, it was so tough that when a million Persians showed up, they funneled them into this pass called the Hot Gates. And for three days, their numbers could not make it through because the Spartans were so locked in. And they funneled them in where their numbers didn't count for much. The Spartans could maybe represent the best of human strength, the toughest people. Their king Leonidas was probably one of their most elite warriors. So now I want to compare that to another 300. I want to take you to Judges. It says the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They fell into worship of a false god named Baal. And for seven years, God just withdrew his hand of protection. And Israel fell into the hands of Midian. And it was so bad, it says, because the Midianites were so oppressive, the Israelites hid in caves in the mountains. Whenever Israel planted their crops, the Midians would sweep in and they would just destroy everything. Midian, uh, verse 6, it says, Midian so impoverished Israel that they finally cried out to the Lord for help. And so did God say, hey, you've been worshiping Baal. I'm sorry. Good luck on your own. What does our God do when we cry out to him for help? Doesn't he answer us? Verse 12, the angel of the Lord came down and appeared to Gideon <laughs> and said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And I think that we could all relate to the answer that he gave. But if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened? I just want you to sit down in that for a minute. Have you ever felt that way? If God loves me and is for me and is with me, then why has all this happened? Verse 14, but the Lord said, go with the strength you have and save Israel for it is I who is sending you. Verse 15, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least of my family. So already we've got King Leonidas, elite warrior, toughened from the beginning. And we've got Gideon over here, who is the complete opposite from the smallest, most insignificant tribe. And he's telling the angel, you've got the wrong guy. I'm from the weakest tribe and I'm the least of my family. And the Lord answered, I will be with you. So Gideon summons the fighting men of Israel and hey, great day. He got over 30,000 people to show up. And God says in Judges 7 verse 2, But the Lord said to Gideon, There are too many fighting men. If I deliver you, you will think it was because of your strength that you were saved. And so God puts Gideon through this process where they whittle the army down to, wouldn't you guess it, 300 fighting men. And now instead of deploying the phalanx, uh, peak uh, military strategy. He says, this is the battle strategy. I want you to take torches and put them in clay jars and have a trumpet. You're going to surround the Midianites. You're going to smash your clay jar with a torch like a grenade. And you're going to blow the trumpet and you're going to shout for the Lord and for Gideon. What kind of battle strategy is this? This is God proving to us who is going to be behind the victory. So Gideon and his men do this. They can you imagine 300 men, by the way, surrounding this camp? They probably were like 50 feet apart. I mean, this, this can't feel good in battle. Judges 7, 19. They smashed the jars with the torches inside and blew the trumpets. And when the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord threw the men in the Midianite camp into a panic. And they began to kill each other with their swords. And the rest of the army retreated and fled. And Gideon and his men hunt them down 
they end up killing them down to the last man, even the king of Midian. So you've got on one side, the strength of man, the best military fighters, the best strategy. The Spartans were killed down to the last man and the Persians made it through in spite of their efforts. And over here we have the strength of God giving them a kind of strange military strategy and whittling the men down from the available men to far less than was available so that God could come in and win the victory. Psalm 121, I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. As we sing this next song, I just wanna encourage you to remember that our help and our victory doesn't come from our strength. It comes from the Lord. And I pray that this song would just hit deep into your heart this morning, remind you, and that you would be encouraged to put your faith and your trust and your ultimate hope in Christ.
sing this chorus one last time. up some praise to our God who always comes through. Lord, we thank you for your victory. We thank you for your care over us. And Lord, we thank you most of all for the victory at the cross, the ultimate win as you put to death our sin, the thing that kept us away from you, God. You put it to death and then you rose from the dead. That we serve a living, winning Savior today. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be reminded that that is the God that we serve, that we look to you for victory and not to our own strength. I pray that you would open your word to us, that it would speak powerfully. It's in the powerful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. together and we've been going through the book of Jonah and we are finally uh, at the end and I before we dive in I want to ask you a question you ever you ever watch a movie or listen you know, a show or something like that and you get to the end and it ends and you're just like wait what like what happened like does the good guy win does the, you know did the bad guy really die do they get back together if if you were a Lost fan in here, you feel this, you understand that. Like maybe you watched for six whole seasons and you left thinking there's more questions than answers and I just don't understand what happened. Everybody, anybody watched a series or a movie and you feel that way? All right, well guess what? We are gonna feel a little bit that way at the end of the book of Jonah because it kind of ends and it's just over. And you're left, what, what, God, what happens? What's, what's going on? What's the next thing? How does he respond? How does this go? And it's that weird unresolved ending. And if you don't like unresolved endings, then the book of Jonah is kind of difficult. In fact, it's a little bit difficult to understand. It's kind of frustrating and, and difficult to preach. In fact, so much so that you look at children's stories of Jonah and, and it, it growing up, like, I, I thought... Jonah ended with like Nineveh turning to God and boom, it's over. Like that's the end of Jonah. Like that's the story of Jonah I knew, right? But that's not how it ends. I, I, like as I got older, I read Jonah and I'm like, wait, what? Where'd this chapter come from? I didn't even know it was in here. So we're going to get to that. But before we dive into that, let's look back at Jonah and take a little review before we get to the fun, exciting, crazy ending of Jonah. So Jonah chapter 1, we see Jonah is called by God. It says the, the Lord spoke to Jonah, calls Jonah, tells him to go to Nineveh and to preach repentance to the Ninevites. Jonah's like, uh-uh, I don't like those people. I ain't going. I'm going to go the other way. He goes down to Joppa and he takes a ship and he's like, I'm headed to Tarshish, the furthest away I can get from Nineveh. And what we discovered in week one is that when we want to run from God, the devil will always provide a ride. And then in week two, we get to the end, you know, and he, he, he's still in chapter one, the, the ship comes, he gets on the ship, the storm comes, the sailors want to get rid of him, like, are like, what's going on? He's like, hey, it's actually me, throw me overboard. They don't want to, he keeps pressing, hey, this is what we got to do, they throw him overboard, storm stops. The end of chapter one, which leads us into chapter two, we get this verse that says, the Lord provided a huge fish. And what we discovered is that sometimes what we call a problem, God calls a provision. And then Jonah calls out to God. In Jonah chapter 2, he prays to God, he confesses, he claims God as his salvation and his hope. 
and he's crying out to God. And then we get to my favorite verse in Jonah chapter three, verse one. Then after he's vomited out on the dry land and Jonah gets a reset. It says the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. And aren't we glad that we serve a God of second chances? God doesn't just call, he calls back and he continues to call. And Jonah gets up, he obeys, and he finally goes and preaches. And he preaches kind of the most lame, reluctant sermon that I think I've ever heard. Like, hey, 40 days, city's going to be overthrown. That's it. Like, Good job, Jonah. You did an awesome job there. But somehow the people repent. God works through the craziest sermon and they repent. And this is the end of Jonah chapter three. When God saw that the Ninevites did and how they turned from their evil ways, God relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. When they repented, God relented. And then the whole nation, from the king to the poorest of the poor, turns to God. And how do you think Jonah's going to respond to this? I mean, think about it. How would you respond? Like, imagine we hold a huge revival in, in downtown Easley or in Pickens or something, and we have this huge revival service, and thousands come to know Jesus, and thousands turn and repent, and they're like, man, I haven't been following after God, and I'm going to turn to God. Like, we'd have a huge party. It would be this awesome celebration. We would be just so excited, celebrating, doing all kinds of stuff, and it'd be amazing, right? That's how we'd respond. It'd be like, God, wow, you're so awesome. This is incredible. That's what we'd expect Jonah to do, right? That's not what Jonah does. Not even close. Jonah chapter 4. I told you it's a weird chapter. It doesn't make a lot of sense, and it doesn't start off very well, and it doesn't make any sense. This is what it says. But Jonah, after they've all repented, after they turned to God, this is how he responds. Joan, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. And he became angry. Now that's like a soft translation there. He became angry. Actually, the, the word for this in the Hebrew is a very strong word. I mean, it's, it's more like rage, like deep seated rage. Any Dude Perfect fans in here? Like, or your kids? Do? Yeah, the rage monster, that's what's happening with Jonah right now. Like, this is, this is big time rage, like upset, just, ugh, I'm out to get, like, I don't like this guy. This isn't fun. I'm totally against this and upset. And then he does this. He prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when, when I was still at home? This is why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. And I, I knew you were going to do this, God. This is what I was expecting. This is why I ran away. He didn't run because he was scared. He didn't run because he was afraid of the Ninevites. He ran because he knew the character of God. And listen to what Jonah actually is complaining about. Jonah, this doesn't make a lot of sense. He's complaining about this. I knew that you are gracious and compassionate God slow to anger, and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now the Lord, now Lord, take away my life, for it's better for me to die than to live. Really, Jonah? What is happening here? It doesn't make a lot of sense. It's confusing, it's troubling, it's frustrating, it's difficult. But let's pause and back up a little bit before we cast too much judgment on Jonah. And remember, Jonah chapter one, we talked about the Ninevites and just how awful they were. And I mean, these people like raped the women where they, they went in and battled. They, they would kill the innocent children. They, they would go in and, and just the worst torture you could imagine. And some scholars believe that, that Jonah's family may have been directly impacted. He may have had a brother, an uncle, a, a grandparent, a parent who was killed, tortured, raped by the Ninevites. Like this is personal now. That goes a little deeper now. And maybe when we start and think about the people or the groups of people 
or the particular religious group or particular political group or the particular person that we think, man, they, do you, but God, do you know how they've hurt me? God, do you know what they've done? God, do you understand what they and, and suddenly, maybe we have a little bit more sympathy for Jonah because we liked God's grace for us, but not so much for others sometimes. And notice, I mean, remember what happened in the last chapter? Like Jonah was obedient, yes. Jonah did preach, maybe kind of reluctantly. He, he did the will of God. He went to Nineveh and preached as God told him to. He may not have been very happy about it, but he did it. And the people repented. And, and I think this shows us something that was a problem in Jonah's life and might be a problem in our own life if we look hard enough and if we really are willing to risk looking at our own hearts is that we discover in the book of Jonah that it's possible to do the will of God without the heart of God. It's possible to do the will of God, Jonah preached to the Ninevites, without the heart of God. God, I'm angry that you actually forgave them. And maybe we do that too, if we're honest. Maybe we give, but we give because, well, that's what I'm supposed to do, and so I'm going to do it. When the scripture says, man, God loves a cheerful giver. Maybe, maybe we, we, we come to a church service, but we're not willing to be the church when we walk out of here. Maybe we, we come and attend, but we're not willing to serve because, well, I'm going to be here, but I don't know if I want to serve. Or maybe we do serve, but we serve because, well, I have to, and they ask me to, and I don't really like it, but I'm going to do it anyway. And we don't serve because we love God and because we love others, but just because we feel obligated to do so. And sometimes, if I'm honest, I realize that I might do the right things with the wrong motives. And maybe if we all look at our own lives, we see that sometimes we do the right thing with the wrong motives. Maybe we do the will of God, but we're not doing it with the heart of God. Yeah, sure, God, I'll serve you, fine. Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll go talk to him, whatever. Uh, yeah, I guess because I have to, I'll forgive him. But I'm not letting him forget. Sometimes we do the will of God without the heart of God. And then the story continues in Jonah chapter 4, verse 5. Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. So, so what's happened, Jonah's camping out like, God forgave him now, but maybe they're going to screw up today or tomorrow, or the next day, and then boom, here comes the fire, and I'm ready, and I'm camped out, and I want to see this. But it's interesting, too, that it says east of the city. It didn't just say that Jonah went out of the city, but specifically that he went east of the city, and that's important, because here's why. If you look throughout Scripture, we see oftentimes that when somebody is going east, they are being they're walking away from the will of God or they're actually being sent away, whether it's a punishment or it's exile or bondage. Throughout scripture again and again, we see that east is often walking away, turning our back from the will of God. Starts out in the very beginning. A couple examples, Genesis chapter three, verse 24. Because Adam sinned, God sent Adam out of the garden to the east. Cain left the Lord's presence in Genesis chapter 4, 16. He left the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod east of Eden. When Abraham and Lot parted, Lot chose to go east to Sodom. With their backs toward the temple of the Lord, men faced east and worshipped the sun. I don't believe it's by accident that it says Jonah went east of the city. Jonah sat down east of the city, probably symbolizing that he's kind of turning away from God again in this. Remember, Jonah's the guy that says, hey, I worship God. That's what he said in verse one, in chapter one. 
I, I worship the Lord, the one who created the heavens and the sea. And here's what I realize in Jonah and what I think we often see today in the American Christian culture. It's possible to claim God, yet live with our backs to him. You see, Jesus even said this. Jesus says in Matthew, and he, he tells a story where he says, man, man, many are going to come to me that day. And they're going to say, hey, God, didn't we serve you? Lord, Lord, didn't we preach in your name? Didn't we serve in your name? Didn't we do all of these things in your name? We did the will of God. But they didn't do it with the heart of God. And Jesus responds. He's going to say, man, I never knew you. And I wonder if any of us, we, we, we claim Jesus, but we're actually got our backs turned to Jesus. Maybe we're doing works for Jesus, but we're got our backs turned to Jesus. God, I'm going to do this for you, but my back is turned. And if you notice, this is kind of awkward. I don't know if it's awkward for you, but it sure is awkward for me. Right? And we're not facing, hey, Jesus, I want to connect with you. Jesus, I want the heart of God, not just the will of God. I want the heart heart of God. I want a deep relationship with you. I, I, I want it all to be yours. I don't want to just say that I'm following you. Man, I, I want to face you. I want to connect with you. I want to know you. I want to be in relationship with you. I want something more than just, hey, yeah, sure, I follow God. And maybe some of us have to wrestle with that. We might be claiming God, but are we really turning towards God? And here's the good news. All, all, all it takes, if we're following God, say we're following God, claiming God, say we worship God like Jonah, but really have our backs to him, all it takes is turn. All that it takes is a turn towards God. Jonah goes on. And he's mad. He's frustrated. He doesn't like what's going on. He's uncomfortable. He's baking in the hot sun. Verse six says this, then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah and give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. Good for you, Jonah. <laughs> like, seriously? Like first, he's super angry that God forgives all these people and he's sitting there. All right, God, what are you gonna do? I'm waiting. And then the shade comes, he's like, ha! Ah. Like, I'm so happy, I'm excited, life is good, I'm waiting for Nineveh to just be destroyed, but I'm happy and I'm good because I'm out of the sun. He's just up and down and up and down, and how do we understand Jonah? Like, it doesn't make any sense. Man, God continues to provide for Jonah, even when Jonah's not faithful to God. And here's what we discover, is that God's faithfulness is not dependent on our goodness, is it? God's mercy is there and ready and always willing. Whether we're always following after him or not, he just calls us, hey, turn. My mercy's still here. My grace is still here. I'll still be here. But Jonah's going up and down, up and down. Happy, mad. And this isn't just like a, a kind of happy, like, man, hey, today's a good day because I realized I had 20 bucks in this pants pocket that I didn't know I had. No, this is like, I just want a million dollars kind of happy. That's the word it's talking about. It's rejoice greatly, exceedingly overjoyed over some shade in a plant. Come on, Jonah. And here's what I discover in Jonah. And sometimes I discover in my own life is that Jonah was more concerned about what God could do for him than what God could do in him and through him. Now, I, I don't care that you used me to change this whole thing. I don't care about them. But God, I'm so glad you gave me this blessing. I'm not so, so concerned about those people, but God, thank you for taking care of me. And sometimes we're more concerned about what God can do for us than what God can do in us. 
and through us. And Jonah loved receiving God's blessing and God's provision, but God was about to teach him a lesson because sometimes what we see throughout Scripture, what Patrick was alluding to as well, is that the Israelites, man, they would get comfortable with God's blessing and forget that they were supposed to be a blessing to the nations. And they're like, hey, it's all about me. And then they would turn inwards and then they'd start turning to other things and they'd forget that it was about something else and something bigger than them. And Jonah kind of forgets that. And he wanted God's blessing, but he wanted to skip the lesson. And maybe some of us want God's blessing, but we want to skip the lesson that God has for us. And God's about to teach Jonah a lesson in the middle of this. And so God provided this plant. Jonah's comfortable. He's happy again. He's all, life is good. I'm sitting here in the shade watching, hoping that maybe God's wrath will come and destroy the city. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint, and he wanted to die. And he said, it would be better for me to die than to live. Complain much, Jonah? Like, it is drama, drama, drama. But I love that the Bible includes all these details because it's real. Like, we get Jonah's real, raw emotions here. Like, it doesn't cover it up. It doesn't just say, you know, Jonah, yeah, he preached and they're good and everybody's happy and it's a happily ever after. No, real life is happening here. And maybe we don't like Jonah and maybe we're uncomfortable with this chapter because maybe it's a little bit too much like real life. I've been um, studying recently in my class a little bit more about counseling, and uh, we're getting just a little bit into psychology counseling uh, briefly, and there was a psychologist counselor uh, who, who looked deeply at Jonah and, and talked about, here are some root issues that are happening in Jonah's life, and uh, I'm sure glad I don't identify with these. Maybe you do, but it's, it's not my problem. Maybe it's just your problem and Jonah's problem, but Jonah has erratic mood swings, doesn't he? Is one of Jonah's problems. Good thing that's never my problem, is it? Where he goes from, man, let's go. I'm on top of the world. This is great. God, you're good. Man, God's praise and blessing and salvation. And the next day, like, what am I doing? God, have you even really called me to this? God, what, what, what have you asked me to do? I don't even like this. Man, just be done with it. Just up, down, up, down. Maybe you can relate to that. Yeah. Life's great. No. Man, I'm done. And he goes from this revival to great anger and back and forth. I can relate to that. Jonah has some entitlement tendencies, right? He's focusing on his own view of justice. And he expects God to work out justice in the way that he wants, not the way God wants. But it's a good thing I, we never do that, right? Jonah has depressive symptoms, manifesting through feelings of burnout, sadness, anger, hopelessness. And maybe we can relate to that too. And it's easy to criticize, it's easy to be like, man, Jonah, get it together. But I get it. <laughs> Sometimes maybe you feel close to God and man, life is good. Other times it's like, man, God, I don't get it. Sometimes we obey God and we're just faithful and on top of the mountain, it's like, wow, God's doing incredible things. And then other times we fall and we stumble and we're like, why again, God? Why did this happen again? Sometimes, man, we, we're passionate and compassionate and man, we, we've, we've got this great heart of God and we want to serve and we want, and other times it's like, I, I just don't even want to do it. I don't know if I even care. Sometimes we love God's blessing, but we hate the lessons that we got to go through to get there. So 
and God provides the shade. The next day, God provides warm and eats the plant. Sun's blazing, blazing. Jonas on Jonah's head. He doesn't like it. He's upset. And he's like, God, this is unbelievable. And so then finally, after all this drama, after all this buildup, after everything we've been through in Jonah chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, and all of chapter four, we get to the end of Jonah. You ready for it? It's pretty exciting. Verse nine. But Jonah said, but God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plane? It is, he said. I'm so angry. I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you've been concerned about this plant. Though you did not tend it or make it grow, it sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh? in which, you are, which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals. There it is. That, that's the end. That's it. Well, maybe you didn't get it. Here's the last line. And also many animals. Oh, now I get it. No. Like, what just happened? It, that's where it ends? Like, God, you, you're the creator of the universe. Like, you brilliantly create. Like, have you seen those beautiful colors on the trees outside lately? The God who created that decided that the book of Jonah was going to end, and also many animals. Like, God, what happens to Jonah? I don't know. Does, does, does Jonah realize, yeah, God, I'm being an idiot. And... I can't believe I cared more about this plant and my comfort than I cared about the Ninevites. I don't know. We don't know. And what happens to the Ninevites? Do they continue to follow after God? Like how long? And do they continue to be repentant or abandoned? In a couple of days, do they get back to their old ways? I don't know. We'll never know. This is how it ends. In fact, I was talking to somebody after first service. Anybody ever see like the, the, the Jonah like veggie tails? And they were like, I, got, I, I watched that as a kid, and I was like, wait, what? And, I, and they had to go ask their mom, like, does it really end this way? Yeah, that's really how it ends. Like, just, it's done. That's it. But why? Why, why, why does this happen? I mean, did, did Jonah's heart change? Did Jonah die? Did, did, did something happen? What's going on? Did the plant grow back again? How, how's it happening? But I think... Part of what's happening and why it's doing this is because maybe it puts us a little bit more in Jonah's shoes. It makes us see ourselves a little bit more. How would I respond? What would I do next? What's going to happen next? And it's open-ended because maybe it's open-ended for us to look at and to say, yeah, how should we respond? What is next? What is God trying to do? Because maybe if we're like Jonah, we, we're more like Jonah than we care to admit. Because doesn't, doesn't God tell us to go into all the world like, and make disciples, yet many of us aren't willing to cross the street and talk to our neighbor about Christ? And maybe we're not going, we're not praying, we're not serving or we're doing those things, but not with the heart of God, and we, we like to receive the mercy of God, but we reject the mission of God, or we want our will, but we don't want his will. Or maybe like Jonah, <laughs> we're more concerned about our comfort than we are his kingdom. But what we also see is that Jonah doesn't get the last word. It's not about Jonah. Remember, he's not the main character. Who gets the last word? God gets the last word. And what we see in Jonah is that God continues to be faithful. So even if we see ourselves in Jonah, what we see is that God will still be faithful. God will still be merciful. God still reaches out to us. God still calls us again. God still offers us another chance. And in fact, Jesus points back to Jonah. <laughs> and he says, this. it's not... He, says even someone greater than Jonah is here. After he says, I'm going to give you a sign, and it's the sign of Jonah. Yes, Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days. Jesus was in the heart of the earth for three days. And now he says somebody greater than Jonah is here. And what's greater than Jonah is Jesus. You see, Jonah's pointed us forward to Jesus. And I think it leaves it open-ended, and it leaves us hanging right there because he says, hey, this is about to be something bigger. There's something bigger even coming. He's pointing us towards the gospel. 
That's what the Old Testament's doing. It's, it's pointing us to God again and again, and it's pointing us forward to Jesus, and especially through the prophets. We see that over and over again, and that's what Jonah's doing, even though it's not mentioned here. This is the story that Jesus is about to unfold, that here the, the, the man who's of God goes to a people that nobody would expect and is offering grace to people that the Israelites at that time wouldn't have expected because they thought it was all about them. But God's saying, no, it's a bigger picture here. I've got a bigger thing. I've blessed you in order that you can be a blessing is what he said and what he desires. And that's what God's telling us. Hey, I've blessed you to be a blessing and I may use you in ways that are even bigger than you understand. And if we turn to Jesus, we're going to see that because yes, Jonah ran from God, but Jesus surrendered to God. Jonah wanted his will, but Jesus wanted God's will. Jonah refused sinners, but Jesus loves sinners and ate with them and died for them. Why? Because Jesus not only did the will of God, but Jesus had the heart of God, who is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in love. And so we could be like Jonah, or we could be like Jesus. And we're called to follow after Jesus, to live like Jesus, to love like Jesus. And yes, Jonah's going to creep up in us every now and then. And yes, maybe we feel more like Jonah than we'd care to admit. But when we're claiming God but have our backs to God, all that it takes is turning. And God receives us again. And God is compassionate and loving and slow to anger. And so I want you to think today, maybe where are you being a little bit like Jonah? Maybe you're, you're following the will of God, but not with the heart of God. Maybe there's a specific area in your life where, where you might be following the will of God in that area, but not with the heart of God. And you want to just give that to God and say, hey, God, and I want, I want to not just follow your will, but I want to follow your heart. Uh, God, I don't want to just claim you, but I actually want to live towards you and in your presence and with a heart for you. Maybe, maybe God, I, I've been so concerned with myself and blessings for me and comfort for me that I've just ignored the calling and I've ignored your kingdom. And God, I just, I want to live for that. How's God calling you today? So I'd encourage you, and sometimes it helps to write things down. There's cards there, and so as, as Patrick comes up and as we close in the song, I want you to reflect for a while. Take that card out, look at that. How is God speaking to me? Where is God calling me? Where am I doing the will of God without the heart of God? How am I acting a little bit more like Jonah, but God's calling me to act more like Jesus? The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. God called again and he calls you again. And we're reminded in Jonah that God gives us a chance again and again and again. But, and every chance from God requires a choice from you. What will you choose today? We choose to turn, to follow after God, a God who is gracious and compassionate, loving, slow to anger, and wants to show you that grace and mercy, but beyond that, wants to change you and work through you to show others that same grace and mercy. Would you pray with me? Jesus, thank you that you are good. God, speak into our hearts. May, may we stop and may we not be so quick to just say, man, Jonah, Jonah messed up. Jonah had some issues, but God, where are the issues that I need to deal with? God, where, what are the hard issues you want me to get to? God, where am I bitter towards others? Where am I doing things just out of uh, uh, obedience, but not out of a heart for you, not out of a true desire for you? God, speak into our lives, speak into our hearts. May we respond to your grace and to your goodness. May you transform us and use us in beautiful ways for your glory, for your kingdom. Because it's not just about us and it's not just about what you want to do uh, in
in this moment, but it's bigger than that. God, you want to do something in us because you also want to do something through us. And may we be ready to see you work in us and through us for your kingdom and your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. And you can respond to God. You can stand. You can worship. You can come pray. You can pray at your seat. But take some time to respond, to reflect, to hear what God is saying to you in these moments.
you to Jesus. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Man, endless glory, endless grace, endless goodness. That's what I want our stories to be. Jesus, we thank you that you are good. Thank you for your blessing and grace. Thank you that your grace not only is for us, but for all of those around us, for the world. God, help us to remember that. God, may we be, uh, God, do a work in us that we are ready to be used by you, to follow after you with all of our hearts and our stories. Point to Jesus. Jesus, we give you the glory and the praise. Thank you for your goodness. In your name, amen. And thank you for being here. I hope that God speaks into your hearts and lives in great ways that God is uh, using and blessing us. We remember that we are blessed to be a blessing. And you got a lot of ways to live that out. Uh, this month, and uh, we we do bags of blessing, and one of the things, especially for Thanksgiving, there's some Thanksgiving bags uh, that you can grab in the in the other uh, in the lobby at the table. In there, you'll see the the display and some uh, instructions on that, what you can do to help provide a Thanksgiving meal for those in need. But also this Saturday, we do our big Operation Christmas Child packing party at 11 o'clock, and it's a great time to come together uh, to to pack those hundreds of boxes that we're going to send overseas and be a blessing to kids around the world. And it's also a lot of fun to do it together. And so I hope you can be here if you can Saturday and be a part of that and help us get those boxes packed. And gentlemen, uh, we've actually got a men's breakfast that morning. So you can come early, come and get some great breakfast at 830 Fellowship, hang around, get ready, help set up for the uh, Operation Christmas Child and be a part of that. And remember that we're blessed to be a blessing. And that God wants to work in us and through us for his glory and his good. So, uh, man, God is good and we're so gracious. And I'm thankful for a church that is that is loving and giving and leaning into that. And uh, we are going to have a Thanksgiving meal together on Sunday before Thanksgiving. we got a combined service again on the 17th. So it's going to be 1030 in the other building. And then a Thanksgiving meal in here just to celebrate the goodness of God and what he's doing in and through us. So I hope you'll be here for that, be a part of that, excited for what God has. And I want to leave you with these words as you go today from Hebrews chapter 13. It says, Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Go.